Welcome to A Cult of Personality, esoteric podcast extraordinaire. I'm your host, Greg Kaminsky, and Billy Hepper is your co-host. Now, in episode number 217, we discuss Catholic occultism, mystical theology, saintly devotion, and exorcism with Agostino Tomaturgo. This is a great conversation with a really unique and wonderful being. Billy and I are big fans of Agostino because of the unique niche that he fills and all the ways that he benefits his followers. If you're already familiar with him and his work, then you already know. And if not, then prepare yourself for an epic Occult of Personality interview. You can find Agostino online at thaumapub.com. That's T-H-A-V-M-A-P-U-B dot com. Originally from Queens, New York, and having grown up in Dayton, Ohio, Augustino Tomaturgo is a unique figure. He is the product of the unlikely combination of a traditional Roman Catholic background and a spirituality-friendly home. It was here that Augustino first learned the basics of meditation, prayer, and spiritual working. In time, he completed his theology studies and was ordained to the priesthood and later consecrated a bishop. Since then, he's left the traditional movement and brings his knowledge to the outside world through teaching and writing, discussing spiritual issues and practical matters through the lens of traditional Christian theology. A Cult of Personality podcast is made possible by you, the listeners, and by the subscribers to ChamberOfReflection.com, our membership website who aids us in the cause of informed, authentic, and accessible interviews about Western esotericism. Thank you again. Because of your support, we're able to bring you recordings of this caliber and many more to come. And please remember... We are in the midst of our Meditations on the Tarot study circle that is open to all Chamber of Reflection paid members. In November, we'll be meeting to discuss the Wheel of Fortune, and you should join us. The intro music is Awakening by Paul Avgerinos. The outro music is Cursed Passage by Equinox, also known as our own Billy Hepper. Augustino, I want to formally welcome you to a Cult of Personality podcast. It's really a pleasure to have you on, and I'm really thankful that you joined us today. Uh, thank you. I actually, actually, I first heard of you about five years ago. Um, Craig Williams suggested you to me. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. he's a good friend of ours, so I'm really he's, glad. He's good people. Yeah, we're trying to get back in touch with each other, but scheduling just isn't working out too well. Yeah, well, you will eventually. I'm, I'm confident. That's great. And I'm really glad that uh, Billy, when Billy and I first talked about having you on, you know, it's it was really exciting, and I'm it's, I'm glad it finally happened. Yeah, yeah I know that we're you. both we're both super excited for this. So thanks for taking the time today, Father. Hey, not a problem. Okay, so I just want to go over real quick. So today we're talking about we're talking about exorcism. Just what I mean, I've got your message up here right now. I just want to make sure I've got it right. Okay, yeah, just Catholic cultism, mystical theology, saints, Marian devotion, and exorcism. That's today? That sounds good, yeah. All yeah, right. I might have some general background questions and sort of opinions about the church and theology questions, but nothing that you can't handle, I'm sure. Well, good. I'm sure, hey, we all have opinions about the church and general <laughs> theology questions. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Billy, why don't you lead us off? Yeah, absolutely. So... Jason, you've had a very interesting personal journey from being ordained to the priesthood in the traditional Latin rite, later being consecrated as a bishop in 2007 to then sort of following your personal calling and publishing a series of books that really sort of focus on the intersection between Catholicism and magic. Could you just share a little bit of the, some of that story where it led you to where you are today? Actually, yeah. It's, I, actually, I'd like to start the story a little bit before then. Okay, because that may help give context. Mm -hmm. Okay, the context the context is I was raised in what's known as a home aloneer amongst traditional Catholics. Okay, right. Both parents were born Catholic. My mother she dis despised the changes after Vatican II, as she as she described it. 
I hope I can curse on here because I'm quoting her directly. Yes. I made a promise to God I would raise my children Catholic, and that shit ain't Catholic. <laughs> that, that's exactly how she described it when I was old enough to understand. Okay, so there's that on the one hand. So my religious education was at home using her prayer, basically her prayer books, her you know old Bibles, prayer books, things that Catholics tend to store from their childhood and never throw away. And the other side is my father. My father, he was a natural psychic, and he ended up with a bookstore in Dayton called the Mountaintop Bookstore from about 86 to 92, where he was a psychic reader, he was a teacher. And so I had influence from, from there, too. So that's the context before the priesthood. So my own studies in occultism began in 1989. I was 15 years old. I found my parents' books in the basement. Okay, if this is getting long, let me know, and I'll refocus. No, not at all. No. Okay, so I found their books in the basement. But you know what? He found them. We may as well let him start reading and learning. Okay, fine. So th that's the baseline. All right, so we fast forward to 1998. I started a website called Christian Occultism and Magic in General. On the internet, some people might refer to it as the Chocolate website because that was the web address, chocolate.8m.com. Okay, that's where, and that, that's the stream that led to where we are here today. The other stream was myself finding myself back, back in, in the church, actually going to church, going to mass. I found the one Latin mass in the Dayton area. Okay, it was indultarian, but it's neither here nor there for the moment. I found that. And that's what led to my journey to ordination in 2002. I tried being a good exoteric. I tried hiding. I tried covering it up. Eventually, it didn't work. 2015, I left ministry. I started Thavma. And here we are today. So you really started young then, that, that sort of melding of the two influences. That's interesting. I commend you just, I was thinking, you know, you know it must have been a difficult path because you were kind of the first to go public with some of these ideas. I mean, it, it was not really being talked about at all at the time. So it's kind of controversial, I imagine, because you had the traditional Catholics on one side who were accusing you of being sympathetic to the occult. And then you had the magical community on the other side who were, you know, wary of anything to do with Catholicism. So um, it's interesting now, you know, nowadays you can find quite a few bloggers and podcasters out there who are talking about this kind of stuff, you know, the mystical, magical side of the Catholic tradition. So. I think it's slowly becoming more popular and people are finally starting to to get it, I think. Yeah, the funny thing is I have a hard time believing I was the first to come out with any of this. Because I know okay, when I was growing like okay, AE Wait, he's constantly he constantly found connections between Catholicism and mystical theology and occultism. Mm -hmm. Right. Even Gareth Knight in his practical guide to Kabbalistic symbolism, he talks about this. So there's definitely a chain of influences, whether an Anglosphere or Francosphere occultism. I, I'm not sure what I was the first to come out as, maybe except saying, maybe as saying I my reading of the Roman ritual in 1996 revealed these things to me. I found these principles and led me on this path. And, you know, and staying within Orthodox Catholicism, that might be the only thing I'm the first person to say. Mm. But... I find that hard to believe too. Well, you may have been one of the first people on the internet to start talking about it anyways. <laughs> okay. Well, it is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've got, I've got no answer. <laughs> um, I've got a question. I mean, I've, I've heard you describe um, your, your spiritual journey, if you will, mm -hmm. as a starting in a, in a place of non-faith, maybe that might be a charitable description. I don't know. But um, to go from that to a place where you were, you know, taking holy orders and then able to perceive the sacred magic within the church liturgy so clearly, can you, can, is, are you able to describe to us what that's like, faith through knowing? Well, I, I can't say I started from a place of non-faith. I can't really say that okay. because my mother may have pulled, pulled us out of the institution, 
but mm-hmm. she but she but she still I don't want to say she believed the doctrine because there were a lot of things she had issue with. And she hates it when I talk about her, even anything positive. So if you hear this, I am I am giving you a massive apology right now. But so I don't want to say that, but she believed the core teachings. She okay. believed the core teachings. Jesus is real. The sacraments are real. Mm-hmm. Okay. She believed that. And that's what she passed on to my sister and to me. So I can't say non-faith. Okay. The crisis of faith came later in when I, I, I had been in ministry for like 2011, about nine years. Oh. That's when the crisis of faith came. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Oh, no problem, man. No problem. So what was it like to sort of uh, take that journey in the holy orders then and and sort of discover the mysteries of the sacred magic of the church. Okay, well, that's the funny thing because I had discovered I had discovered the the big discovery hap- happened six years before I was ordained. It, okay. ha- it happened before I even started on the path towards holy orders. Mm-hmm. I was in okay, I was in UD's library in Dayton, Ohio. I was told that because I'd read as many occult books as I could. At the time, it, it was it was the '90s. We all know what was published back then. I'm not naming names. Okay, I'd read as much, and I'm like, I can't really go any further. I need something. I need something better. And I was told, UD's library, the sixth floor. My best friend said this to me. They've got all these, but they have a bunch of occult books there too. So I I, I went up there. So I went up there. This was what spring of 1996, I believe. Mm-hmm. Okay, I went up there. And they do have a section. You'll have like uh, Abermelon. You'll, you actually have a few grimoires. You have some books on Kabbalah. Both um, you have Christian Kabbalah. You have Jewish Kabbalah. May, I'm trying to remember if there was Hermetic Kabbalah in there. I don't remember. But so they actually did have an occultism section there. And then you go further to the back. If you're going in at the back left side, the back left corner, it's the BX section. They had all the liturgical books. And a, I came across like the three volume edition of the Roman ritual and I'm reading through this volume two is exorcisms. Of course, that's going to catch a 22 year old's eyes mm-hmm. it catches a lot of people's eyes. Even now mm-hmm. I'm looking over this, I'm reading it. And then I go on there. Volume three, the blessings I'm looking at this and I'm not just reading Weller's introduction to volume three, which is actually a really good, it, it's it's a really good tell as far as the sacred magic that's in church ritual. But I'm looking at the process. Adjutorium nostrum nomine domini, our help is in the name of the Lord before the blessings, who made heaven and earth. Acknowledging the power source, acknowledging why we call upon the power source. The next one is Dominus Vobiscum, the Lord be with you. Et cum spiritu tuo and with thy spirit, the next two versicles. This is, cre- this is creating a current. The Lord be with you. That power source be with all of you that are here. That creates a current. A circle. Et cum spiritu tuo. That's completing the circle by saying, with you as with you and with thy spirit as well. Everybody in the room is now being covered and within the purview of the power source is being called upon. Mm. Then the actual text of the blessing, this is what the power source is being called upon to do. And you can see this as a form of rudimentary talismanic magic because mm. you're consecrating this object for specific purposes. Yeah. And so that's where I got my first curl between that and the rites of exorcism, which mm-hmm. that plays in much later on in my journey that maybe we could talk about later or whenever. Yeah, it's, you know, I agree. You don't have to dig that far underneath the surface to find all kinds of magic in the church. I think, you know, it's the Catholic church is unique because it's one of the few spiritual institutions out there that still readily admits to the validity of magic. You know, they have mm-hmm. dozens of prayers of deliverance against witchcraft and magic that you've outlined in your new book. Um, you know, prayers for unbinding, prayers for breaking the results of curses. And, you know, these are standard prayers that you can find in any Catholic prayer book. They're not some sort of a, a secret doctrine. So really, Catholics should have no issue at all with at least admitting, I think, that, that magic is a thing and its effects are very real. You know, I can, I can remember for myself the first time that I witnessed, you know, a full high mass in a cathedral with the the holy water and the priest incensing the altar and the chanting. I mean, I immediately thought, wow, this looks a lot like a ceremony of high magic. And so I know I'm not, you know, alone in this feeling. 
that this was all very new to me at the time, and, and it was exciting because I came from a very strict sort of fundamentalist Protestant background. Um, but I remember I got home from that first Mass, and I, I Googled something like Catholic magic or Catholic secret magic, and one of the first results that came up was one of your books, Father, The, the Magic of Catholicism. That's how I was first kind of introduced to your ministry. So it's um, interesting. I mean, I really liked your description recently where you defined the idea of Catholic magic as being applied theology. I really like that. You know, the magic part comes from working within the confines of the tradition, you know, using things like the rosary, you know, working with the saints, prayers to the Blessed Virgin, you know, things like that. The magical part is that side effect of the applied theology actually working, actually taking effect. So it's an interesting distinction to make, I think. And when you begin to look at magic like that as a kind of applied mystical theology, I think, you know, any Christian shouldn't have any issue with it at all. I 100% agree with that. Mm -hmm. I think the issue there is that the definition of magic is, is kind of like a they're selling Coke and we're selling Pepsi kind of conception. Yeah. Like the definition of magic that the hierarchy, and I want you to notice I'm making a distinction between the church and the hierarchy. Okay, I'm making a distinction there. Okay, the hierarchy has consistently defined magic in strictly goetic terms. Right, magicians are either con artists or they're trafficking with demons. Right. And in, and in both cases, it is idolatry. It is, supersti it is idolatry by way of superstition and therefore a, a violation of the first commandment. In fact, if you look at magic in moral theology textbooks prior to Vatican II, I've never looked at a post-Vatican II textbook, so I cannot speak to that. But pre-Vatican II, you, the most you might get is like one or two paragraphs on the subject, uh, with, with a begrudging admission, a begrudging admission, and I think this comes from Aquinas, that if it can be demonstrated to work through natural means, then it is then it is allowed. But every other means is absolutely not allowed. We must assume it is demonic. And so that's where I think that the that the prejudice, for lack of a better word, that most Christians have against the concept of magic, I think that's where it comes from. Even, for example, you could take reviews, for example, reviews on Let's Pray the Rosary. I looked at my Amazon reviews recently when I posted that to the wall. And one of them actually said, the author is satanic. Yeah, I mean, we're laughing, but people actually believe this because this is what they've been programmed to believe. Mm -hmm. You can look at many different examples of sacred magic in the Bible. I mean, Moses, Elijah, mm -hmm. they were pretty much referred to as magicians overtly. And that's, you know, that's a whole other conversation, I guess. But Well, I'll yeah. do you one better. The book of Tobias. Raph Raphael tells Tobias to catch a fish and to, and to use the heart and the liver. Mm -hmm. Right. For, mm -hmm. right. That, that, that is... First off, apotropaic magic, removing Asmodeus from Sarah's bedchamber. And the second part is healing magic to heal his father's blindness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's not just hinted at in the Bible. It's said outright. Now, mm -hmm. open, now, if you open any page of the Gospels at random, Jesus is telling you how to do it. Faith, mustard seed, moving mountains. You get the picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to follow up with the question i mean i noticed on your website you have a link to the pico's oration and and he got in trouble with the church for partially proclaiming this idea <clears throat> that one of the ways you could know the truth of the faith is through natural magic and so they didn't like that and i'm just wondering you know what your opinion of it at that point and as as this whole thing kind of rolls forward and it's almost like it divests people of their power to sort of like, you know, gain, you know, all sorts of uh, benefit, including strengthening of faith through spiritual power. Okay, I, I, I'm going to give two answers to that. The first one, I want to, I want to frame it. Okay, because the exact, the exact proposition. This is from Pico's 900 Theses. The exact proposition that got him in trouble was nothing certifies us more of the divinity of Christ than magic and Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. And it was a trend in the Renaissance to use the, to adapt, appropriate the Kabbalah in order to pr prove the divinity of Christ or use it to prove the truth of Christianity. So mm -hmm. he was in the mainstream of intellectual thought at the time. 
Okay, but that's the part that got him in trouble. Nothing proves the divinity of Christ better than basically experience, experiencing it. Now, all three of us know that this is true or that it can be true because experience gives knowledge. But the main thing that got him into trouble then, okay, the main thing that got him into trouble then, and that would get me into trouble now, is that we're dealing with a, we're dealing with a hierarchical authoritarian culture. Okay, the, the, the ecclesiastical culture, now in Pico's time, it was not as bad as it is now. It wasn't as bad as it is now, but he directly challenged that statement. Directly challenged the authority of the the authority of the quote unquote magisterium to establish the balance of truth that must be believed without question. Right. Okay. In fact, the Catechism of the Council of Trent actually says curiosity is a bad thing in the very first section. The modern Catechism, the Catechism of the Nova Sordo Church, nineteen ninety two. I believe it was a section 80, 79 or 87. I forget the number. It says the faithful must believe with docility. I'm going to repeat that word docility, what the magisterium teaches them. All right. So what we're seeing, it, it's a, it's a top down teaching structure. Now this ties into the second thing that you mentioned that the magic is being de- magic and authoritative, actually authoritative, use of spiritual power might be a better way to frame that the laity are told that they are denied it they are told that they cannot do blessings they cannot do exorcisms in 19 now 1985 then cardinal ratzinger said you cannot use any exorcism in which the demon is demon's name is asked or addressed directly specifically referring to the exorcism against satan and the and the fallen angels which the laity were allowed to use all the way up to that time. Mm-hmm. All right. So what we're finding here, it's a clamping down where from Pico's time, especially from after the council of Trent until today, there's a clamping down of power. There's a clamping down of authoritarianism and it's reinforced by the laity actually believing it and most not thinking to question it just to pay, pray and obey culture. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's a powerful truths there i would say Mm -hmm. thank you for that so father you've completed a series of three books now that are focused on this topic of exorcism so this includes the handbook of exorcism and deliverance then we have uh, medieval rituals of catholic exorcism and finally the big book of exorcisms could you just talk a little bit about the sort of genesis of this trilogy what made you want to publish these books and maybe you could give people a brief overview of what they'll find in each one of these books because I think you've really dug deep here to translate and compile some very unique, some very obscure exorcism rituals from the Catholic tradition. Okay, the genesis of the books, you're going to be disappointed. It was a writing contest that I thought of entering but could not have completed in time. Wow. (laughs) You had to write a story about a succubus. And I was writing a story about a case that I had dealt with in 2006. It was like a massive fictionalization of that case. I'm going to do a novel on it sooner or later. I couldn't do it in time, but I'm like, you know what? It was July of 2019. Why not just write a book about how to do exorcism? That was the genesis of the handbook of exorcism and deliverance. Mm. Okay, so after, after, after that, now what you're going to find in there, it is as complete as I could think of during the time I was writing it, as complete as I could think of a guide towards what is exorcism, how does exorcism work, what to expect during an exorcism, what kind of bases could you cover? Like, can you do exorcism? Like, do you have to be a priest to do exorcism? What kind of bases can you cover? Do you have to cover like safety, legal, all that stuff? What kind of aftercare to expect? What things to expect during an exorcism? Several rites of exorcism, several that are not included in the Rituare Romanum, the standard book of exorcisms. And a brief chapter on what deliverance ministry is, the good, the bad of that. So that's pretty much what to find in the handbook. It's like your your basic, your 101 level guide. Right. Okay. Medieval rituals of Catholic exorcism. That was more of a, more of a curiosity project on my part. Because right around the end of handbook, the handbook, I was discovering all these old, the older rituals, the medieval rites, the, the things that 
came really close to the grimoires because these manuals and the grimoires, they shared materials liberally between each other. Hmm. In fact, in some cases, the village necromancer and the village exorcist were the same person. Hmm. And someday I may form a band called Clerical Necromantic Underground. Nobody steal that. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but it was that, that was a genesis. It was so before that, I spent a year learning how to read paleography and scribal abbreviations and the different medieval handwritings. And that's what led to medieval rituals of Catholic exorcism. It was my curiosity to see how deep does this well go. And I realized, oh wait. This stuff is completely, completely unknown outside of academia. People need to know about this. Mm-hmm. It's like there, there, are, there are academics who've gone through and they've published whole grimoires and transcriptions, but this is the other side of the story. People need to know this. So that was the idea behind medieval rituals of Catholic exorcism. That's also why I put in that book several times, do not use these. These are not meant for use. I take no responsibility for what will happen to you if you try it. And finally, big book of exorcisms, because medieval rituals of Catholic exorcism started as that, and it started also as the idea to make a DLC for Handbook of Exorcism and Deliverance. I originally wanted to have medieval rituals, early modern rituals, Renaissance rituals, but I wasn't able to fit that in. So that's why the big book comes into the picture. This is the final, the final DLC, this and Masses to Cast Out the Evil Spirits, which I just released, which is the full text of Masses I wanted to put in here, but didn't have, have room because of the page limit. Mm-hmm. Lulu has an 800 page limit. So this has medieval, renaissance, early modern, but these have been tested and these are actually, these are tested and cleared for use. You can use these and you will get good results with them. Mm-hmm. So that, that's, that's the purpose here, to give you the field advice to give you the extra rituals, the extra oomph that you need to get the job done. Right. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, just to go down this path a little bit further, could you maybe just shed some light for us on the church's sort of definition of demonic possession, like the the Catholic stance on what exactly demons are and, and how they can affect us? Because I feel like people nowadays, they're only kind of exposed to the idea of possession, maybe through like Hollywood horror movies and that sort of thing. So I'd like to clarify like how the church defines it and also your experience as someone who has assisted in deliverance cases. Okay. Okay. Well, what demons are is defined and the most succinct expression of this is in the four, in the fourth Lateran council in 1215, that the demons are formerly angels who rebelled against God and then they fell from grace. Okay. Beyond that, Demonology, it's very loosely defined, and it seems to change depending on what century you're in. Okay, that, okay, so that's what demons are. How demons operate. There are actually three. Modern day, you'll have four modes, but there are actually three modes. Temptation, which is self-explanatory. Obsession, which is when they bother you, but without entering your body. And possession, where they enter your body, they may control, control your body. Like, say, somebody has a remote control or a brain chip in your brain but they don't control your will. Your will remains free. You're just not able to move your body. Hmm. And okay, so that's, that's the three ways. Now, more recently, since the 80s, there's a fourth way called oppression, where obsession is emotional. Oppression is, they afflict you emotionally as obsession. When they afflict you physically, it's oppression. That was just from the 80s. I think it comes from Pentecostal, del- Pentecostal de- de- deliverance circles. Mm-hmm. where they just wanted to give a clear definition between the emotional and the physical. Right. Okay, so that's the modes of demonic activity. Now, I'm guessing, the, I'm guessing part of this question is, how does possession happen? How can it take place? Mm-hmm. Okay, this is, where, this is where you can find some differences of opinion. Okay, what I, what I have seen is generally is generally one of a few things. There could be there could be like a father's curse. Well, a father's and mother's curse, because a, pa- a parent's curse on a child, which tends to be very difficult to break. For example, the Earling, Iowa exorcism in 1928. A woman was possessed. Now, the spirits claim to be the ghost of her father, of his mistress, the ghost of Judas Iscariot, and a number of demons who are just speechless demons. But the record is very sensationalist. But so with that claim, and the central claim is the possession happened because 
the father's mistress cast a curse on this girl, and the father supported it. So that's that's the emphasis. So a, a curse can cause possession. Even in the seals of Solomon, there is one of the seals, I think, of Saturn. L- let Satan sit at his right hand to cause us per- first be possessed by demons. Forgive me for being vague. My memory of it is, I'm not a grimoire, so my memory of it is very sketchy. But I just remember that being being in there. Okay, so we have a precedent for that. Magic can cause somebody to be cursed directly. Magic can also co- sorry be possessed directly. Sorry. Magic can also cause somebody to be possessed indirectly. I had a case in 2013 where one of my former parishioners, she was possessed. But what happened was some ex-friends of hers were trying to cast spells on her. The entity actually hijacked the spell and used that as a conduit. Hmm. All right, so that's another, that's another way. I've seen that happen maybe in two or three cases. Another way you can consciously make a deal with the entity uh, Malachi Martin talks about this in his Hostage to the Devil. There are multiple stages, and one of the stages where the entity can offer the person various powers, one of the stages towards possession, the entity can offer this person various powers or extra knowledge, something where the person could be more willing to, willing to accept this, and the possession can happen through there. Okay, demons do not have legal rights, contrary to what some people say. Okay. Okay, that's an idea of very recent date, but they do have permissions. So these are different ways that that it can happen. It could be childhood trauma that just leaves you vulnerable to it. It could be any number of things, but ultimately what Catholic theology says is possession happens because God allows it. Okay, thanks for that distinction. Yeah, that helps a lot. So I guess what would be your general advice to people who are deathly afraid of of the demonic who might perceive anything remotely supernatural as like a potential attack from a demon? How much do we have to fear from them? What's kind of the best way to counteract them? Okay, well, I've got a few things there. Well, the first thing is you have a better chance of winning the lottery than you do of being possessed by a demon. Right. (laughs) So go get your Powerball tickets now. (laughs) (laughs) All right. And that's like, what, one in 300 million? It's but it's been a while since I looked at what those odds were. Okay, so yeah, so go get your tickets. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing, and I think this is more important, is that your fear of it can actually create a subconscious vulnerability. Okay, think think about this as magic workers, spiritual workers, occultists, and all that, okay? Think, think about it this way. Your emotions do play into your results. Your emotions play into your results. Your emotions play into your disappointment. Your, your emotions can sabotage you because they send messages to your subconscious. Mm-hmm. And that constant fear, fear that, say, if I don't put my pillows back on the bed in the exact right way, I'm going to get possessed in my sleep. But suppose it's so much as like a 16th of an inch off. You're, you're subconsciously sending a message. Here, come, take me. Mm. Mm-hmm. So I would say that that fear is that fear is a liability more than an asset. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, I mean a healthy fear is one thing, but an irrational fear is the problem. Okay, and lastly, lastly, I, w- I would I would suggest that especially if we're talking about an irrational fear, there's usually something else going on in, inside the psyche that is leading to that irrational fear. It's manifesting as that, but. Whether we're talking, we're finding a therapist, whether we're talking some kind of processing, just do find a therapist, read a copy of Psycho Psycho Cybernetics, just do something to find out what is it that's at the root of this? What's the root of this? And how can I fix this? How can I become a whole person? Because that's your best defense is being a whole integrated person. Mm, That's great advice. Thank you. Yeah, I I agree. That is really great advice. Um, I guess, you know, I, I'm curious because I, I know that when I've inquired about exorcism in the past, even the person who was teaching me about it, their stance was like, it's great that you want to learn this. And I'm happy to like, give you some basic teachings about it. But if on the rare chance that you were to come across someone who actually required an exorcism, you should not engage in this activity 
under any circumstances, your first move should be to call or contact someone else who's more qualified than you are to do it. And I'm wondering if you agree with that uh, and and what level of proficiency or faith or practice is necessary to be effective at this? Okay, what love what level of faith? I'm not sure anybody can answer that because I, I have seen exorcisms done by people whose I wouldn't say their faith was the size of a grain of mustard, you know, I'm, but they're not total atheist either. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, I'm not sure what level I'm, I'm going to come back to that in a moment. I want to move on with proficiency. You do need to gain some proficiency and you need to have at least as much proficiency as a really solid grimoire magician, Mm -hmm. how to, how to discern spirits, how to interact with spirits, how to know when they're trying to pull one over on you. you you need to have, I'd say it's about the same level of proficiency, Mm -hmm. right? The, the, The main difference is they're not in the triangle. They're not inside of a, they're not inside of a crystal. They're either in the room or they're in somebody's body. Okay, right. that, that's the main difference is, is it's your operating parameters. Okay, but that's for proficiency. As far as, far as experience, when the teacher said do not do this under any circumstances. Okay, for somebody who is a rank beginner, no experience whatsoever, I see where that mm-hmm. can be good advice. But the thing is, if you're serious about doing this, the best thing to do is to find a mentor. Find an experienced exorcist who is willing to mentor you, and and li- listen listen to what listen to what they tell you. You you in time you will just like any other mentorship, you will develop your own two feet. You will figure out your own style. You will figure out how to work things, and you will become proficient on your own. But do not try it under any circumstances. Seek out somebody. That just sounds that just sounds like I'm. The person saying, there's really no point for you to learn this. This knowledge is useless to you. Right. And I really disagree with that. Okay. Thank you. So when people hear about deliverance from a demon, you know, they usually immediately think about movies like The Exorcist, you know, head swiveling around, projectile vomiting, things flying around the room. Um, But just reading your new book, The Big Book of Exorcisms, um, I was really struck by like the nuances you might say the many different categories and distinctions that the church has around exorcism. You know, there are hundreds of different pros of deliverance. There are blessings to say over your food and objects, you know, Mm -hmm. everything from removing curses from livestock, you know, there are prayers of exorcism that are said when someone is baptized. So, you know, exorcism is all over the place in places that you wouldn't really expect. And it's not always said in this context of like spiritual warfare, you know, with the big dramatic showdown between the exorcist and a demon. Um, Could you talk a little bit more about some of these lesser known examples of exorcism that maybe are not so familiar to us? Absolutely. In fact, I'm going to lead by by pointing out that there are two forms of exorcism. There's the apotropaic and and there's the epiclectic. The apotropaic is, I command thee, demon, go away, get out! Go back where you came from! That's apotropaic, where you're directly commanding it. The epiclectic is, Please, God, take this entity away from us. So you're praying for God to intercede on your behalf. Now, when I said earlier, the co- I said earlier, possession possession requ- cannot exist without the permission of God. What you're doing is you're praying to God to take away that permission sooner rather than later. Hmm. Okay, that's epiclectic exorcism in a nutshell. Okay, so in so where was I going with this? Oh yeah, different types of exorcism. My brain's not braining today. Can you tell? Okay. <laughs> okay. So with different types, with different types. So those are your two main types. Okay. Beyond that, we can have something as simple as say Compline nighttime prayer, which is, which is effectively a prayer for protection. In fact, I think it's, I think it's significant to point out that even amongst occult literature, uh, an example would be Melita Denning and Osborne Phillips, Llewellyn Practical Guide to Psychic Self-Defense and Well-Being. They, one of the things they say in there is to, to pray Compline, whether Eastern or Western, right at nighttime as a form of protection. Mm. And that's exactly what Compline is, meant, Compline is meant for. It's a protective prayer. Send your angel into this house to drive far from it the snares of the enemy. 
That's the, the main col colic prayer in Compline. So that is an epiclectic exorcism. So we can start there. We can start with the asperges that said before the high mass on a Sunday. The prayer send forth your angel to, to protect, to visit, to defend, to cherish those who dwell in this habitat. That's an epiclectic exorcism. There are the, the blessing of holy water has exorcism set over it. Right. The bless, as you mentioned, baptismal exorcism. And it's not we assume there's something there. It's just in case there's anything there, we want it gone so this person, this place, or this object can be sanctified for God's use. Mm -hmm. There are blessings and exorcisms to be said over meat, over milk, over butter. And these did not make it into the official Roman ritual. These were found in diocesan rituals as late as about 1775. That's the latest that I found, the latest date that I found on these books. Mm -hmm. They're in the big book. And in fact, the dairy products is important because if we read the literature on witchcraft, it's yeah. you very commonly hear, hear it said that the witchcraft literature says that witches are known for cursing cattle. They're known for causing hail. They're known for making milk and butter spoil. Mm -hmm. So that's the connection where these exorcisms come from for, to protect, to protect the products, basically protect the products of an agrarian based economy. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've always thought was I always thought that was pretty interesting, especially when I first found them. So yeah, there are little things like that. There are exorcisms written by. I know I'm rambling, but I'm going to close this up real quick. There are exorcisms written by private persons. There are exorcisms written by attributed to written by different saints. The Eastern Orthodox exorcisms of Saint John Chrysostom and and Saint Basil, Basil the Great, for example. Mm -hmm. The list goes on and on. There's no way I can really encapsulate this without talking before an hour or two. Yeah, the variety, the variety in your book just kind of blew me away. Like really obscure stuff like, you know, an exorcism of King Charles the Six, you know, some really wild stuff in there. So you must have really dug deep to find that stuff. It was it was a funny thing is I didn't have to dig that deep to find it. It was just <laughs> like one thing led to another thing, led to another thing. Then this author would cite another author. Like I love the that. Yeah, it's like the the hardest the hardest to find were the old medieval manuscripts from the 15th century and prior. Mm -hmm. Those were the hardest ones to find. Mm. Anathema Publishing Limited, quality occult books and contemporary esoterica. Established in 2011, Anathema Publishing aims to provide superior literature in content and form by creating a trinosophic relationship in Troth and Gabo between publisher, author, and reader. Anathema Publishing produces refined books for the true bibliophile on topics ranging from Gnosticism, traditional craft, alchemy, hermeticism, witchcraft, to Luciferian Theosophy. www.anathemapublishing.com August, you know, I want to follow up on something you mentioned earlier about the exorcisms, which was uh, that you had actually tested these out and you could ensure that people get good results from them. And I'm just wondering if you could tell us more about that process of testing them out. Actually, yes. And actually, if you don't mind, there is a review. There is a product review that I've been that I've that I've owed Allison Chikovsky for about a year. So, would you mind if I talk about talk about that too? Because yeah, it ties do. into a case I did last September. Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to tell you two things. The first one is that a couple of years ago, Allison Chikovsky she sent me a fifth pentacle of Mars, along with the fourth pentacle of the Sun, which I've already reviewed. Okay, I had a case last September where this man, he was, this man, he was being troubled with famili familial spirits, for lack of a better word. He had a head injury, and it made him very clairvoyant and clairaudient. Actually, I'd worked with him before in, in, in psychic work. He was extremely helpful, but he had zero filter. That's kind of important for the next part. Actually, he had like a, pup a puppet. There was a puppet on his hand that was that had that had a spirit in it. 
Hmm. Yeah, that's it was pretty wild. So, wow. anyways, he's being troubled. Okay, he's being his mother had died. He's being troubled with with all kinds of entities. So what I did was I actually want to find it in the book. Actually, it's one of my personal favorites, even though it's kind of gross. Okay, so I so I used a diagnostic procedure from CLM 10085. Okay, except instead of putting my thumb in his mouth, like the book says, I put the fifth pentacle of Mars on his head. Put the fifth pentacle of Mars on his head, and th then I said the diagnostic. Abramonte abria, abramonte con sacramentaria, ipar ipar tumba, o pote alata de la fie. And then I'm just going to read this part in English. I said it in Latin. I conjure you, accursed spirits, through the terrible name of God, Agala, and through the most powerful name, Agala Helene, through which may take to trembling the hosts of heaven, of earth and of hell, and through the great and ineffable, ineffable name, Tetragrammaton. I conjure you to evacuate the veins written in these verses. The 370 veins for a long time belong to thee fully, such at the same time the 240 bones. I likewise conjure you through the great name Pnevmaton and through the name Isaton to rise up to the tongue and give me a laugh. So you're commanding the spirit, you're commanding the spirit to prove its presence by laughing at you. Hmm. And that's pretty much what happened. Long, 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 long story short, both this conjuration and the fifth pentacle of Mars, the results were amazing. Yes, the entity was very present. The entity very much revealed itself. This diagnostic does have a flaw in it I discussed on, that I discussed on my blog, but that flaw, didn't, that flaw was circumvented with other things. In any case, the entity did reveal itself. It was very present, and it was gone very quickly. Hmm. So again, yes. my highest review to, to um, Allison's work, five stars. And once I started using some of the material in rituals of catholic exorcism well medieval rituals once i started using it that's when some of that material made it into the big book mm -hmm. because it was being tested there was another one from the same book that's my of my medieval books that's my favorite one just to put it out there mm. but i would tell and anybody and everybody the version of the vinculum salomonis that is in this book do not read it out loud if you are not using it if you're not actually using it out in the field, mm. because strange things will happen. Fair warning for sure. Yeah, that is a, a important uh, warning. I'm glad you mentioned it. <clears throat> well, I made the mistake of pub when I was working on the book. I made the mistake of posting a partial translation in in a group, and I told everybody, "Do not read this out loud." About three people. Guess what they did? Exactly, they read it out loud. I'm hearing, I'm hearing things like animals scurrying. So they're posting about animals are scurrying, the lights are flickering on and off. You know the the usual stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, that, that that can get dangerous. I, I know from personal experience. <laughs> exactly. So I'm, I'm sitting there wondering, okay, so should so should I give them advice or should I just have a smug grin and say I told you so? It's yeah. it's one of those weird situations. Yeah, you get, get fair warning, and it's blatantly ignored and disregarded. So, I was hoping that we could kind of double down on this topic because, of course, mm -hmm. like any time that you start talking about exorcism and demonic possession, you know, people want to hear the the spooky tales, the spooky stories. Um, we are coming up on Halloween, so this might be appropriate. You've had obviously firsthand experience with cases of demonic possession. You know, obviously, there's a lot of sensitivity around not disclosing all the details, but could you maybe just share with us a, a case that stands out in your mind as particularly compelling or any stories that you have around actual exorcism and, and how it all went down? I'm trying, I'm trying to think because the, the first exorcism I did is one that will always stand out in my mind. It was an object. Okay, long story short, long story short, it was a handheld fan that it belonged it belonged to my sister she loaned it out to an acquaintance who tended to have just something really icky stuck to her. it's all i can really say mm. i'm trying to be kind here i'm 
But you know, some people just just have entities and things that just stick to them, mm-hmm. and they don't even know about it. That's what happened here. Okay, so what happened there was the object came home, and I'm be and I'm hearing, okay, just be careful with it. My sister said, be careful with this because this this one her her name was Shannon. Change to protect the not so innocent. Okay, so Shannon had the, had this fan, and I wrapped. I just wrapped it in an isolation cloth. There's some. It's something that uh, in the system that I created when I was 16, I created this object called an isolation cloth. It's a black cloth with the tetragrammaton on one side and the pentagrammaton on another. And across, and it, you wrap it around an object in order to isolate its influences from getting out into the world. Right. Well, this was the first real test of it. Within a week, everybody in the house, I was 19, I was living at home at the time. Everybody in the house is having really strange dreams. And for me, it was a dream where I was being chased down, I was being chased down a sidewalk, and this black dog comes up beside me comes up beside me and actually barked wherever the thing chased me was away. Really good dog. Okay, but when I woke up, it just hit me. This is the thing. This is what it is. So my sister, my sister and I, and our, our, fr- our friend Jordana, we went out. She knew a place where we could go and just b- bury the object. Okay, she knew where it was. It was actually right next to her home because we get in Jordana's car. She drives us, but it took us like three hours to get there. It took us three hours, like all these twists and turns and getting lost. Mm-hmm. And then, on, then as we get there, my sister and I start getting to arguments. We get, start getting to arguments about what to do. We're not going for any of your magic stuff, not the words she used. We're getting into arguments. And we finally find the place where she rec- where Jordana recommended to bury it. So it was a burial rather than an exorcism. And these these kids just come out from nowhere. I should call them kids. I think they're in their twenties. They're coming out from nowhere and they start throwing rocks at us. <laughs> they're talking crap. They're throwing rocks. It's like resistance after resistance after resistance just to bury a simple object. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Finally, it happened. Finally, I get to bury the object, and everything stopped. Hmm. Everything stopped. We made it home. A good time was had by all. The end. But that was that was my 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 first case, if you want to call it that. Right. Okay. Another case was. Remember one we talked about the genesis of handbook. And I mentioned a case in two thousand and six. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's that one. This was a. Th- this case was a neo-pagan who she called herself a voodoo literally everybody practice every practitioner i hear you cringe and i apologize for using that word but that is what she called herself Fair enough. Mm-hmm. okay th- there was there was no initiation involved and she tried to call on papa legba in order to bring more money into her life to open a door to bring more money into her life well something came through the door but it wasn't money mm-hmm. She started having health problems, one of which involved bleeding that doctors could not explain. Please do not ask me to get more detailed on that. She, but she started having health problems. She started having all kinds of difficulties in her life. And how I found out about this was my, my deacon at the time, Miguel. Okay, my deacon at the time, he was initiated. His father was a babalao. Where he was 72, his father was a Babalao. He'd made it as far as Orator or the Oracle. I don't know if that's a thing. I know that's what he told me. And he said, okay, if you have anything of hers, give it to me. Get me a bowl of water. He put his hand in the bowl of water and did a reading. And everything he said rang true. There is an entity involved. The entity is purporting to be her grandmother and once her. Okay. Now, my mistake here was I followed his advice about what to do about it. He told me to do epiclectic exorcisms involving the aid of St. Raphael. Mm. Okay. So I did that repeatedly. 
And eventually, the entity. Now, I'm not very clairvoyant. I don't see very well, but I can, I can hear. I can hear entities better than I can see. And the entity actually reached out to me eventually and said, okay, I'll make you a deal. I got the name. I got the entity's name, and the entity offered me a deal. Long story short, the case was successful. The entity was expelled. But the entity retaliated by making me homeless for two weeks. This is what I talked about in last. This is what I talked about, I think, was this past Sunday's broadcast. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I ended up homeless for a couple. I did have another place to go. I just had to wait two weeks before I could, before I could move into it. So I ended, up, I ended up couch surfing between Miguel's house and my mom's for those two weeks. By the end of the year, everything else was back on track again. But that's another thing. If they are weak, if they are weakened to a point, they will offer you a deal. Hmm. Whether you take the deal or not, generally do not take the deal, but whether you take the deal or not will have a bearing on whether you will succeed with the exorcism. But the hmm. aftermath, as I was working another case in 2008, and that same entity showed up and turned friendly and helped me on that other case. Why well, I mentioned in, in the big book, I mentioned what to do if, if a formerly exercised spirit turns friendly. Hmm. That's why that section is in there because it happened. That's fascinating. That's really cool. I love hearing like the war stories. This stuff is always fascinating. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, no, no problem. Yeah, I'm curious uh, because I mean, from my own experience, and and I'm curious from yours. Uh, there are, I think, significant differences in terms of like occultism that's sort of like free range you know, where the person is on their own or even maybe in a group, but, but compare the, comparing that to working within the structure and framework of like a, a religious faith tradition and maybe from the esoteric side, but nonetheless, can you talk about the, the differences and, and maybe what I what I'm really hoping you're going to do is talk about the strengths and advantages of working within a structure of a religious faith tradition as opposed to kind of free ranging it. Okay, I, I think the main advantage versus disadvantage is the presence or absence of a roadmap. Because mm -hmm. to to use a word that that you used pretty often at the beginning here, Greg, journey. It is a journey, and if you're working inside of a if you're working free range. You're reinventing the wheel. Like that's literally what I did when I created my first magical system, the Libre Artum. I named it that because of the title, the three bind. I gave the three binders that I keep the notes in. Okay, so I, I invented that whole cloth. I had to learn everything from trial and error. In fact, I spent the three, the past three years, relearning everything from trial and error. Hmm. But, but working from a from a different plateau of knowledge than I had then. Mm -hmm. Now, free range, you have a lot of potential dangers because you are learning trial and error. You may be relying on a book that may have good information, but you have no idea. You don't know who the author is or what the author is into, mm -hmm. especially when each of us was growing up. We didn't have the kind of connectivity with the rest of the community that we have now. We were all working on our own, or some of us may have been in a group. Okay, there's that. But when you're inside of a faith tradition, you have a roadmap that is, you have a roadmap from people that have been there before you. The same may be applicable to, say, the lodge systems. There's a roadmap from people who've been there before you. Because the lodges, they kind of are their own faith traditions. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have their, their beliefs, they have their theologies. Even if they don't call it that, it's their roadmap to the universe. Within Catholicism, for example, you have. You have the maps of mystical theology. You have the writings of St. John of the Cross, of St. Teresa of Avila. You have Reginald Garrigou Lagrange's Three Ages of the Interior Life, which is like the baseline of all the technology, all the technology that Catholic mysticism has to offer. He, he gives a very concise manual in 1,200 pages. Exactly. That's how much there is. You have that to go on. You have the availability of spiritual direction to go on. You have so much to work with from people that have actually walked the road and are and have gotten to where you're trying to be, as opposed to just trying to do it on your own and just 
hope it works or hope you don't hope you don't mess things up even worse than they already are. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that's a hundred percent correct. Uh, Augustino, yeah. I just wanted to switch gears a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I hope this doesn't open up a whole can of worms, but um, we don't have to address it all today, but I'm curious what you would say to people who might be struggling with like trauma they might've experienced with negative associations with the church, you know, maybe from their childhood, but they may feel still drawn towards some of the traditions of Catholicism, you know, later in their life, they might feel an attraction towards the saints or the figure of Mary, or maybe it's just an appreciation of the beautiful art and music and architecture of the church. I guess I'm wondering, like, how can we begin to heal and come to terms with some of the many skeletons in the closet of the Catholic church? You know, you hear about the clerical abuse scandals, the, you know, horrible residential school system, that sort of thing. You know, this stuff can act as real obstacles really to people who want to explore the traditions of the church, but they have these negative associations. So how can we start to address some of these wounds? Okay. Now, the problem here, I'm not going to call it a problem, but the challenge is a better word. The challenge is that the trauma is going to be different for each individual. The manifestation is different. For example, I once met a woman who could not even stand to hear the word Jesus being said. Mm -hmm. And so now for somebody with that level of trauma, it's going to be insanely difficult, if not, if not impossible. For somebody who is drawn is drawn to i'm going to say the aspects of the church I'm talking about the saints the blessed mother the the passion of christ and so on i'm going to say aspects of the church rather than the church as a whole ball of wax right i think the best thing is to realize two things the first is to find and ask what is it inside of you what is it that happened or what is it inside of you that's the manifestation of the trauma. Where is the trauma living inside of you? I'm struggling to find the right word to, to um, express this. Where is the trauma living inside of you? Exactly how is the trauma manifesting? What can you do or what can't you do? And is it possible to get help? I, I, I'm always going to recommend some kind of therapy. It doesn't matter if the trauma was religious. It doesn't matter if the trauma is sexual, if it's familial. It doesn't matter if the trauma was bullies picking on you at school. I will always recommend therapy because we are terrible judges of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So get, get some kind of help to make you whole, at least to the best of their ability. The second thing I would say, I would point out that and we were just talking about the independent movement, for example. There are, there are churches that either practice most, most of Catholicism or part of Catholicism in different, different dilutions that exist outside of Rome. There are churches that do this. Most of them are small. You may have a tough, uh, if you don't live in a larger city, you may have a tough time finding one in your location. But you can, find, you can actually, you can find a Latin mass. You could find a Latin mass with a rainbow flag out there even. Hmm. That actually exists. You can find a, you can find a Latin mass with a very cons in a very conservative congregation. That also exists. Ditto for the Novus Ordo, ditto for the Anglican liturgy, ditto, ditto for anything and everything. And so you do not have to go back to the Novus Ordo church, i.e. the church that's based the post Vatican II church based in Rome. You do not have to go back to that. You do not have to go just to the Eastern Orthodox Church or to one of the bigger churches. You can go to the smaller churches. There was a different set of challenges there, just like Greg and I were talking about a moment ago. There was a different set of challenges there. There are many different ways of doing things there. And, you may, and it may take a long time before you find one that's actually a decent fit for you. But the option exists. And like I mentioned earlier, there are some true gems. If you can find one of those gems in your area, that's where you want to go. Right. Excellent advice. Thank you. And, you know, this is where I think starting to explore some of these traditions at home, too. You know, if you're not comfortable with walking into a church and attending Mass, you know, if you're just looking for a starting place, you know, learning to use maybe the rosary 
as a contemplative practice, you know, exploring the lives of the saints, you know, these are all things that anyone could do. And I think anyone can find benefit from these practices. These are gifts, you know, that we can all experience. And once you start forming your own private devotions, it's interesting from my own experience, how it begins to heal your, your outlook and your relationship to the church. And it might even lead you to start attending mass, you know, when you begin to approach it on your own terms. So that's the starting point, I think. And for me, it helped me personally, as I was dealing with a lot of my own kind of fractured perceptions and negative stuff that I had around Christianity. Um, you know, don't let them win. Don't let a few bad people and bad experiences keep you from exploring this path if you are feeling drawn towards it. That's that's my advice. It also, it also sounds like you're. That, that it also sounds like that helps re- recognize that God is not those idiots in the church that hurt you. Absolutely. Or God is not those idiots that are talking about everything but what they're supposed to be talking about at the pulpit. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. That's exactly. It. Yeah. Thank you both. I really love that question, Billy, and just the, the whole thing is, I felt like really important to say, and yeah. I'm really glad to hear it. In the second half of our interview, available to members at chamberofreflection.com and our Patreon, Augustino Tomaturgo continues the interview delving even more deeply into Catholic occultism, exorcism, and much more. Join us for that second half of this compelling conversation. And I'd like to remind you again that although you're able to listen to this podcast at no charge, it costs time and money to create. We ask you to support our efforts and the creation of future podcasts by joining the membership section at chamberofreflection.com or subscribing via Patreon at patreon.com slash occult of personality. As always, if you're already supporting the show or have done so in the past, my heartfelt thanks and I salute you. <laughs>